Hi everyone, and welcome to the 10X Genomics Virtual Cancer Symposium. In today's talk, Single Cell Genomics and Checkpoint Blockade and CAR T Cell Immunotherapy. I'm Abby and your moderator for today. Before we get started, I'd like to go over some quick housekeeping items. Our speaker, Dr. Ansu Satpathy, will be giving a recorded presentation followed by a live Q&A session. We're recording this session and we'll make the recording available shortly. Please note that all attendees are on mute, and if you would like to ask a question, please submit it using the Q&A option on your screen. Thanks to all who attended yesterday's session with Dr. Alex Swarbrick. As a reminder, today's talk is part of the series, and we'll be hosting more webinars throughout the week. Please join us tomorrow for a talk by Drs. Carl Gay and Allison Stewart from MD Anderson titled, Increased intratumoral heterogeneity after the onset of therapy resistance in small cell lung cancer. Now let's meet our speaker for today. Dr. Ansu Satpathy is an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology at Stanford University School of Medicine. He is a member of the Stanford Cancer Institute, the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy, the Immunology, Cancer Biology, and Biomedical Informatics Program, BioX, and a faculty fellow in the Department of Chemistry, Engineering, and Medicine for Human Health at Stanford. Dr. Sadpathy completed an MD and PhD in Immunology at Washington University in St. Louis, clinical residency in pathology at Stanford Hospital and Clinic, and postdoctoral training in genetics at Stanford University. Dr. Satpathy's research group focuses on developing and applying genome scale technologies to study fundamental properties of the immune system in health, infection, and cancer. And now I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Satpathy to get started with his presentation. Please remember that Dr. Satpathy will be taking questions live after the presentation. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks to Abby and 10X for that nice introduction and uh, for the opportunity to share some of our work today. Thanks to you all as well for tuning in, and I hope that everyone is staying safe and healthy during this difficult time. As Abby said, my name is Ansu Satpathy. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology at Stanford. And what I'm going to tell you about today is some recent work that we've done really over the past year or two to develop and apply single-cell genome technologies to understand the immune response to cancer. These are my disclosures. So what our group is generally interested in understanding is the cellular and molecular basis for immune responses to cancer directly in patients. And we try to approach this question using several different technologies. First, we use single cell RNA-seq to understand uh, what are the cell types and immune cells within the tumor microenvironment. We try to pair that information with antigen specificity using T cell receptor or B cell receptor sequencing. We take those measurements over time in an individual patient or across patients to understand the dynamics of the immune response. And finally, we try to understand the regulatory factors that might control these responses or cell types using epigenomics uh, and also CRISPR perturbations. And the reason that we care about all of these different layers of information is because we think about their utility maybe in the same way as we think about Google Maps. Google Maps is useful to you because it layers several different types of information onto the same landscape, right? Where the people are, where the streets are, where the shops are. And knowing all of those pieces of information is really critical for that to be useful to you for navigating that landscape. And in the same way, we think about integrating several layers of molecular information about a cell uh, as allowing us to really fully understand what that cell is doing in an immune response and how we could potentially modify that response for clinical benefit. And in particular, we're interested in understanding this response in the context of cancer immunotherapy. As many of you know, in the last decade, we've really witnessed a revolution in the way that we treat cancer. Instead of directly targeting the cancer using things like chemotherapy, radiation, or even surgery, what we now do in many cancer types is target the immune system. Now, perhaps the most successful uh, immunotherapies to date have been blocking antibodies that target PD-1 and CTLA-4. These are inhibitory receptors on T cells. Uh, these therapies, also called checkpoint blockade, essentially lead to an increased activation state of the T cell response to tumors and have shown a really tremendous clinical responses in a subset of patients. 
For example, on the right of the slide, you can see imaging from a patient with metastatic melanoma prior to, prior to therapy. And after treatment with CTLA-4 antibodies on the bottom, which demonstrates a dramatic decrease in tumor burden in that patient, which really was stable and remained uh, at least 10 years later. But even though we do see success stories like this in many patients, uh, which is the reason for, for such excitement, the reality is that most patients still don't derive any benefit from this treatment at all. And therefore, what we and many others are trying to do is uh, to understand the fundamental basis for immunotherapy response uh, in the hopes that we could use that understanding to really design more efficacious uh, immunotherapies that would benefit many more patients. So what I'll tell you about in the first part of the talk is our effort to do exactly that in the context of a cancer type called uh, basal cell carcinoma, or BCC. BCC is a skin cancer and is actually uh, the most common cancer in the U.S. with about 2 million or so cases per year. Uh, this cancer is driven by UV radiation, uh, which means that in most cases, uh, these tumors have a large number of mutations, um, similar to melanoma on scale, which typically means that they should respond well to checkpoint blockade, uh, checkpoint blockade agents and T-cell recognition. And that actually turns out to be true. We did one of the first clinical trials at Stanford for monotherapy PD-1 treatment in uh, patients with refractory BCC, meaning they weren't responding to their standard chemotherapy or targeted agents. And we showed that in, in this sort of difficult patient uh, cohort, we could get about a 30 to 50% response rate. And you can see that some patients uh, responded uh, tremendously well. Uh, so now we can use this setting to try and really understand some fundamental questions about how this therapy was working. In particular, we wanted to ask what are the T cells or what are the types of T cells uh, that are even in the tumor? Uh, which ones are responding to PD-1 treatment versus sort of uh, sitting there as bystander cells? And where do those responding cells actually come from? Were they already in the tumor prior to treatment and we could use that as an indicator for who would respond? or were they actually newly recruited from, uh, to the tumor from peripheral sites, uh, such as the blood? The benefit of studying skin cancer is that these tum tumors are readily accessible without the need for any invasive procedures, right? So actually what we could do is serially sample the same tumor pre and post therapy in each patient. So in this study, we looked at 11 patients, and in each patient, we took half of the tumor pre-therapy and half of the tumor post-therapy about two months later. And because of this sampling strategy, we had essentially a perfectly matched control for each patient. So we harvested tumors, dissociated them to single cells, and ran uh, the immune profiling assay, which obtained single cell RNA-seq data, and also matched TCR alpha beta sequences in each single cell. What you can see on the bottom of the slide is the data from all of the patients aggregated together in a reduced dimensionality plot where individual cell types are annotated in different colors. So what you can see is a large number of T cell types, which I'll come back to in a minute, but also other immune cells, such as myeloid cells and B cells, as well as stromal cell types and even tumor cells. It's important to note that, in general, immune cell states were shared across patients, so it's not as if we saw every patient had a different T cell type. Uh, they were generally shared uh, across all patients. But this was in contrast to tumor cells, uh, which tended to be patient-specific. And we think this is likely driven by uh, the presence of unique genetic mutations that are actually driving each tumor in each individual patient. So not every BCC uh, is exactly the same, and this has been shown uh, in, in other uh, tumor types as well, such as head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. We now zoom in on only the T cells from the previous plot. So on the left here, I'm showing you a reduced dimensionality plot uh, of only those T cells. What you can see and what we were surprised by initially was the diversity of T cell types in the tumor microenvironment. It was previously thought that a tumor might just have activated CD8 T cells or maybe uh, some inflammatory CD4 T cell types. But what you can see is really the full spectrum of T cell phenotypes uh, that we know in the tumor, including regulatory suppressive T cells, a variety of CD4 uh, positive T helper cell types on the left of that plot, and then really the full differentiation spectrum of CD8 T cells, uh, including naive activated memory and exhausted cells. 
On the right, what I'm showing you is the same UMAP, but now individual cells are colored by whether we also obtained a paired TCR alpha beta sequence in that same cell. Uh, if we did, we color that cell blue, and if we didn't, it's gray. And what you can see is that the whole map is blue, meaning that in the vast majority of cells, we do also obtain uh, paired uh, TCR alpha beta sequence in that same cell. Using this paired RNA and TCR sequencing information, we can now ask a number of fundamental questions about the T cell response in the tumor. And that's because in addition to serving as an indicator of antigen specificity, the TCR also serves as a very useful lineage tracing marker. Since TCRs are somatically rearranged, highly diverse, and passed from a parent to uh, its daughter cells. Therefore, if we see, for example, five T cells that have the same TCR alpha beta sequence, we can assume that they derive from the same parent cell and belong to one clone. The first question that we asked was, how are clonal T-cell responses in the tumor coordinated? Is it that a T-cell will, will recognize the tumor and then proliferate and expand, and then all of the daughter cells within that clone will stay relatively coordinated in their phenotypic response? Or is it that cells would divide and daughter cells would have the ability to adopt different phenotypes? So one cell could become a Treg, another cell could become a Th17 cell, et cetera. So what I'm showing you on the left of the slide is the same U map that I just showed you, but now we're coloring a few individual clones uh, using different colors. So the dots uh, colored in purple all have the exact same TCR alpha beta sequence, same for the dots colored in green or the dots colored in orange. And what you can immediately see is that cells within uh, an individual clone are highly correlated in their phenotype, right? They fall in this uh, relatively the same spot on the U map. This is true if you look at a few individual clones uh, like we are on the left. It's also true if you look across thousands of clones uh, across all patients uh, on the right. And it's, this is also true if you compare cells uh, from samples that are obtained uh, pre or post therapy. So what this tells us is that the clonal response to checkpoint blockade is highly coordinated uh, within clones and that this does not change uh, with anti-PD-1 therapy. So PD-1 is not working to increase the phenotypic space of expanding T cells. Uh, they're still remaining highly coordinated in their response. Uh, the green bars on that plot uh, show you something uh, a bit more, which is now if we group uh, different TCRs together based on their ability to see the same antigen using this glyph algorithm that was developed by Mark Davis's group, what you can see is that TCR clones that recognize the same antigen also tend to be coordinated in their phenotypes, suggesting that what's driving this coordinated response is the antigen that the T cell is seeing. The next question that we asked is what phenotypes of T cells uh, or T cell clones are actually being expanded by anti-PD-1 therapy? Are all T cells recognizing the tumor and expanding after therapy, or is it just a subset? So on the left, we're plotting clonal expansion of T cell types uh, pre and post therapy using a Gini index calculation. So pre therapy expansion is colored in light blue and post therapy in dark blue. And what you can see is that PD1 blockade is specifically causing the clonal expansion of this a particular phenotype of exhausted CD8 positive T cells. These cells also happen to express uh, the marker CD39, uh, also known as NPD1, which has previously been shown by Evan Newell's group to enrich for tumor-specific T cells. So we can now connect these three aspects together, tumor specificity, clonal expansion, and exhausted, uh, this exhausted T cell phenotype at single cell scale. This also supports the idea that only a fraction of T cells within the tumor are actually recognizing the tumor or responding to anti-PD-1 therapy, uh, and that most of the T cells are actually nonspecific bystander cells. So it is important, I think, to actually take these T cell measurements or, or understand the tumor microenvironment at single cell resolution to separate uh, signals in relatively rare or infrequent tumor-specific T cells from abundant bystander T cells uh, in the same tumor. 
So many of you who are immunologists may be asking, how does this make any sense? Exhausted T cells are essentially defined by their inability to proliferate in response to an antigen. And I also just told you that after PD-1 therapy, clones still stay coordinated in their phenotypic response. But I think the dogma in the field has been that uh, anti-PD-1 works by actually reinvigorating exhausted T cells uh, and uh, now allowing them uh, to respond to the tumor once again. Uh, but these were the questions that we had as well, and we reasoned that we might actually have the right data set to be able to ask this question since we had matched biopsy samples pre and post therapy and also now the ability to track individual T cell uh, clone responses over time. So we asked a simple question, which is, are clonally expanded exhausted cells post therapy present in the same tumor pre therapy? And the plot on the left shows you that the answer is no and that the majority, even up to 100% of T cell clones that expand uh, after PD-1 therapy were not found in the same tumor uh, pre-therapy. This was true across all patients, and you can see uh, was actually most pronounced in patients who uh, demonstrated a clinical response. So if this is true, where are the clones coming from? And I think there are two possibilities. One, that the clones are present at some low frequency in the tumor microenvironment, uh, below the limit of detection for us, or two, that they're being activated and recruited from the peripheral immune system. To start to answer this, we asked whether new T cell clones post-therapy could be found circulating in the blood uh, of the same patient. So if you look on the, the Venn diagram on the left, uh, what you can see is that among all tumor infiltrating T cell clones, a large fraction of them, of them could indeed be found in the blood. Uh, but if you focus on the two small pie charts on the bottom right, uh, these are now restricted only to an analysis of novel T cell exhausted clones. And what you can see is that about 35% of these clones could be found circulating in the blood at the same time point post therapy in a patient. But surprisingly, what we could find is even a fraction of these clones, uh, about 10 or 12%, uh, circulating in the blood two months earlier in the pre therapy blood. So even though we couldn't find them in the tumor, we could find them in the blood pre-therapy. So I think more work needs to be done here, uh, but at least we can provide some evidence that novel clones are indeed derived from the peripheral immune system. So in summary, what I've told you in this first part is that we could use single cell paired RNA and TCR sequencing in primary patient samples to really uncover some fundamental aspects of the T cell response to PD-1 blockade. First, that it induces expansion of a subset of CD8 positive exhausted T cells. Second, that this expansion is derived from new T cell clones that were not present in the tumor pre-therapy. And third, that we can find these clones circulating in the blood. I think this actually has some important implications for the way that we think about uh, targeting tumors with T cell therapies. And maybe uh, this is actually good news in that these responses can be measured in and derived from the periphery. Uh, I also should say that all of this work was done together with a fantastic graduate student, Katie Yost, uh, in collaboration with Howard Chang and Ann Chang at Stanford. Okay, in the second part of the talk, I want to return to this idea of building a Google Maps of the T cell response and integrating different molecular layers of information to really understand uh, the T cell state. After seeing the clonal expansion of exhausted T cells, we became really interested in understanding what exha exhaustion actually means in terms of the molecular programming of that cell. In other words, some groups had suggested that exhaustion uh, may simply result from the upregulation of inhibitory receptors, and that if you remove those receptors, that the cell could regain its function. Obviously, the clonal results that I just dis discussed with you argue against this possibility, but we wanted to ask this question in the context uh, of primary tumors uh, using deeper epigenetic profiling. To do this, we used a method that our group previously developed called ATAC-seq, or assay for transposase accessible chromatin with sequencing. This was a method developed by Jason Buenrostro, who is a former graduate student at Stanford who was in uh, Howard and Will Greenleaf's lab. And what Jason figured out is that you could use this uh, naturally occurring transposase, TN5, 
whose job it is to cut and paste transposable DNA elements across bacterial species. So what you could do with this enzyme is just load it instead with standard Illumina sequencing adapters and then dump that complex onto cells or nuclei. And what the enzyme would then do is find any open area of chromatin in the cell and insert those sequencing adapters. Uh, you could then just PCR that and then sequence to identify, uh, really with base pair resolution, the location of active enhancers and promoters uh, genome-wide in a population of cells. Initially, this method worked in as uh, few as 50,000 cells and uh, was really a game changer for, for immunologists because you could now, uh, really for the first time, take these measurements in uh, rare immune cells from primary samples. I think there are many ways to demonstrate the utility of this method, but I'll give you just one example here. Soon after a tactic was developed, Jason, together with Ryan Courses, another postdoc in the lab, performed uh, a tactic and RNA seq in parallel in primary immune cell types sorted from healthy individuals. And what they did in this experiment was to compare the information that you could get from each assay and ask. Uh, was there anything that you could get from ATAC-seq measurements that you couldn't get from RNA-seq measurements? Or what was the, the benefit or the additional information gained? On the left, what you can see is an example of the ATAC-seq data represented as a signal track of a specific locus, the TET2 locus. And every line represents the data from a unique cell type. And every spike in that track represents an open enhancer or promoter controlling TET2 expression. On the right, you can see the RNA expression of TET2 represented as a bar graph from each of these populations. So what you can immediately see is that the RNA level of the gene doesn't change very much, maybe twofold uh, across the developmental trajectory uh, from a hematopoietic stem cell to an end stage T cell or NK cell. But in contrast, the ataxic profile changes dramatically, uh, even down to certain enhancers being uh, fully on in progenitor cells and being fully off uh, in end stage cells and vice versa. Second, you can see that there are many more, maybe 10 or 20 enhancers controlling the expression of this single gene. So what that means is if you zoom out and try and cluster cell types using RNA expression or distal enhancers from ataxic data, you can do a much better job using ataxic. And so the simple way that we think about this is that a taxi gives you a richer view of the cell state uh, because it takes many more measurements, uh, and those measurements tend to be more cell type specific. Of course, in order to integrate this information with single cell RNA or TCR data, we really needed to advance the method to have single cell resolution as well. So together with 10X, we developed a method to perform a taxi in droplets using the Chromium platform. I won't go uh, really into the details here, but briefly the way that we design this is that cells are first transposed in bulk, but leaving the nuclear membrane somewhat intact so that it serves as essentially the first cellular partition in the process. Then transposed nuclei are fed into the droplet system uh, that we're all familiar with, uh, together with cell indexing and amplification beads. And after droplet generation, all of the molecular biology is uh, performed in a tube to amplify taxi fragments from each cell. The important point is that this method produces relatively high quality single cell taxic data on par or exceeding that of what we've seen on other platforms. And it also maintains a relatively low doublet rate. With this method in hand, we essentially immediately went back to the basal cell carcinoma samples to ask the question I posed in the beginning. And that is, do exhausted T cells exhibit a distinct chromatin state and epigenetic profile compared to other T cell types or are they just really similar to activated or memory T cells with the additional expression of inhibitory receptors? So what you can see on the left is again, aggregated single cell data from about 11 BCC patients pre and post PD-1 therapy. But now each dot represents an ataxic profile computed from about 15,000 unique enhancer or promoter sites in each cell. I don't have to walk you through the cell types. It's exactly the same as what we saw in the single cell RNA-seq data. And again, uh, the CD4 T cell types are on the left in this plot, and the CD8 cells on the right. But what you can see is that exhausted T cells do indeed form a distinct T cell state compared uh, to other cell types, which is characterized by the unique accessibility of around 5,000 enhancers and promoters. So in this sense, 
exhausted T cells have just as unique of a chromatin state as any other uh, T cell type that we typically think of, such as T regulatory T cells or T17 cells. And so we really should be thinking of them in this way as a distinct differentiation trajectory uh, that we need to understand and target, rather than just T cells that uh, happen to be expressing high levels of PD-1 and poorly proliferating after antigen stimulation. So to dig deeper into this differentiation trajectory, we computationally linked together single cell ataxic profiles as cells went from the naive T cell state to the exhausted state, and then lined up individual cells along this trajectory. We could then ask, what was the temporal activation of individual enhancers or promoters or transcription factors as cells uh, went through the process of exhaustion? So perhaps if you look at the far right plots first, the red and blue heat map show you the activity or activation of all of the enhancers that are changing as cells go from naive state to an exhausted state. Uh, and you can uh, see that we've pointed out unique enhancers that control gene expression only in exhausted T cells. The yellow and blue plot shows you the activity of transcription factors that also vary along this continuum. And you can see that we've highlighted uh, at the bottom there a core group of about five transcription factors that are active in exhausted cells and not in other cells, at least not in this coordinated fashion. Finally, we could once again ask, does PD-1 blockade actually change the chromatin profile of exhausted T cells? So are newly recruited T cell clones also entering the same chromatin state that was present in the pre-existing tumor uh, T cells, or are they able to maintain a more functional phenotype as a result of being uh, recruited in the setting of anti-PD-1 therapy. So this is the same UMAP, but now colored based on whether each cell was obtained from a pre-therapy or post-therapy sample. And you can see that although there are more of these exhausted cells post-therapy, sort of bottom right cluster, uh, colored in blue, uh, they still enter exactly the same chromatin state of exhaustion. So we think that although PD-1 can recruit this new army of T cells to fight the tumor, Ultimately, these cells are still limited by the fundamental uh, molecular programming of T cells that chronically see tumor antigens. So therefore, checkpoint blockade may provide a window of therapeutic effic efficacy, but if the tumor isn't eliminated in that time, uh, your T cell still may become exhausted and uh, you may see a relapse. To summarize the second part, what I've shown you is that we developed a new method to profile chromatin state in single cells using the chromium platform. And we've used this method to profile T cells in the tumor microenvironment. And I think we've shown two important things. First, that exhausted T cells in human tumors have a distinct chromatin profile. And second, that this profile is not changed by anti-PD-1 therapy. So I think understanding this cell state and finding a way to reverse it is really of central importance to developing long-lasting efficacious immunotherapies uh, for cancer in patients. Again, I'll say that all of this work was done together with a terrific graduate student, uh, Jeff Granja, uh, together with Howard Chang, Will Greenleaf, and Grace Zhang and her team at 10X. In the last 10 minutes or so, I want to talk about some of our really recent efforts to modify T-cell therapies in humans. And the way that I think about this is as a natural next step from our genome profiling effort, and that once we use these technologies to really understand the cell state, like T cell exhaustion, the next step should be to try and engineer that cell state to develop and improve therapy. And in that sense, we're very fortunate that chimeric antigen receptor, or CAR T cell therapies, have already been employed extensively in the clinical setting. So for those of you who are not as familiar with uh, cell therapies or uh, in particular CAR T cells, I think of these as the other major pillar of cancer immunotherapy. Briefly, what a CAR T cell is, is an engineered hybrid receptor that encodes the antigen recognition domain taken from an antibody, uh, or the SDFV portion of an antibody, and the signaling domain taken from the T cell receptor. So what many people have shown in the past and this was really pioneered by the work of Carl June, is that you can isolate T cells uh, from patient blood, lentivirally introduce this fusion receptor with specificity against the tumor antigen onto the blood T cells, and then reinfuse those cells into the patient. And those cells would then uh, find the tumor, uh, recognize the tumor antigen using 
this modified receptor and then kill those tumor cells. And what we've seen is that these therapies uh, have really been highly effective in a specific uh, cancer settings, and particularly in the setting of B-cell leukemia or lymphoma using a CAR T-cell targeting the antigen CD19. Uh, you can also do this exact same process, uh, but instead of uh, introducing a, a hybrid CAR receptor, you can just introduce a T cell receptor uh, that you found to recognize a particular tumor antigen. But again, despite uh, uh, these really terrific successes in liquid tumors like B cell leukemia or lymphoma, CAR T cells have largely failed to show positive results in the context of solid tumors. And what we and others have shown recently is that in many cases, the reason for this uh, is once again the development of T cell exhaustion. So the CAR or the TCR engineered T cell will enter the tumor and start to kill it, uh, but it then eventually will receive too much antigen stimulation and become exhausted. And that limits the efficacy. So that the data I'm showing you on this slide was done in collaboration with Crystal Makel's group at Stanford. And what we're showing is that CAR T cells that recognize CD19 behave appropriately, uh, continuing to expand after stimulation, while CAR T cells recognizing a solid tumor antigen, here denoted as HA CARs, rapidly upregulate inhibitory receptors, fail to proliferate, and enter the exact same epigenetic exhaustion state as I just described to you in the context of the PD1 response. So I think. We view this as an opportunity, right? Since both checkpoint blockade and cell therapy suffer from some of the same limitations, we could pair the insights that we're getting from checkpoint studies to improve cell therapies, either to resist T cell exhaustion or to have other beneficial tumor killing properties. So in this last part of the talk, I'll tell you about what I'll our first sort of effort in this direction, and that is to perform targeted genome editing of genes and CAR T cells that we think will improve their efficacy in patients. Obviously, the major barrier here and the goal of this first study was to assess the safety of this type of therapy and to get any insights we could from that were being infused. This was the first FDA-approved CRISPR trial in CAR T cells, and so obviously this was really a tremendous effort across many institutions by many people, but really led by Ed Stadmauer and Carl June at the University of Pennsylvania. So the design of this study was that we decided to make four genetic modifications in these engineered T cells. The first modification was to add a T cell receptor that recognizes the tumor antigen NYESO1, uh, which has previously been shown to be ex expressed on a number of tumors, and NYESO engineered T cells have been efficacious in some of those settings. Uh, the second set of modifications was to introduce CRISPR guide RNAs that would edit and inactivate three genes, the TCR alpha, uh, alpha chain gene, the TCR beta chain gene, and PD-1. The rationale for editing TCR alpha and beta came from prior studies showing that endogenous TCR genes could limit the functionality of the engineered NYESO transgene. And the rationale for editing PD-1 came from some of the prior work that I have already discussed here, suggesting that PD-1 deletion could improve T cell function. Obviously, this trial was designed many years ago before some of the recent studies on PD-1 uh, came out, but this now again serves as a method to determine whether PD-1 deletion alone or in combination with TCR deletion could improve function of CAR T cells. Uh, to date, we've been able to enroll three patients in this trial, two of whom had refractory myeloma and one of whom had metastatic sarcoma. And so all of the data that I'll show you today is from those three patients. The first and most important thing that the team assessed is whether the products were safe and whether they were being rejected by the recipients. And to summarize a lot of data very quickly, indeed, we did not observe any adverse clinical effects after infusion of the product, and patients did not develop any antibody response to the Cas9 protein. It should be noted that the way that we edited these cells was to transiently uh, electroporate RNP complexes of the Cas9 protein loaded with mixtures of guide RNAs. 
And so we didn't necessarily expect to see significant immunity since the protein uh, would probably be depleted during the CAR T culture period prior to infusion. But what I'm showing you on this slide is that perhaps to our surprise, the engineered cells did in fact persist in vivo uh, in the patients up to 300 days after infusion as measured from genomic DNA in the blood or when we could uh, obtain it in the tumors. And importantly, we could measure this from NYESO amplification, uh, but also from amplification of the individual gene edits, suggesting that even the edited cells also pers persisted long-term in each patient. But what we really wanted to know was which combination of edits uh, actually resulted in the best outcome in terms of persistence and phenotype of the infused CAR T cell. And so now we had a problem, right, that our infusion product was essentially a mixture of cells since CRISPR editing isn't 100% efficient in every cell. And the methods we were using to measure persistence were performed on bulk populations. So it was difficult to really know what the heterogeneity uh, of cell edits was in the initial product and which combination of gene edits provided the most persistence benefit. So to answer this question, we once again return to the single cell chromium platform and this time used a slightly modified protocol that could obtain single cell RNA-seq profiles uh, as well as the presence and sequence of edited target genes. Again, I won't go into all of the details here, but the modification was relatively simple where we just amplified targeted gene regions surrounding the CRISPR edit sites in the PD-1, TCR-alpha, and TCR-beta transcripts after generation of the cDNA library. So at the end of the day, uh, what we have is an RNA-seq library for each cell and the sequence of each of the targeted gene edits in that same cell. Uh, and so what you can see on the right is an example of the gene edit analysis where every line is a single cell from an infusion project product from one patient, and the dark red uh, indicates the presence uh, of a detected mutated gene target in that cell. Uh, so in this particular patient, you can see that a mixture of cells with different patterns of gene edits uh, were infused. So next we generated these single cell profiles across time points in each patient. And here I'm showing you the results uh, from just one of them. So what you can see on the left is a plot reproducing the persistence analysis that I previously showed you, but now generated from the single cell data. What you'll notice is that while, for example, TCR alpha and NYESO edited cells seem to persist pretty steadily over time, cells with PD-1 mutations uh, really tended to decline. Uh, but now on the right, we can look at these cells with the single cell resolution uh, single cell editing resolution. And here we just categorize them as cells that are completely wild type or have one, two, or three of the target genes edited. The left bars, uh, the left two bars are NYE, so negative cells, and the right two bars are those cells uh, where we can detect the TCR, the NYE, so one TCR transgene. And what you can see is that uh, we can find cells that receive all of the intended edits in the infusion product. So they have NYE, so one and three mutated target genes. So this is the yellow part of the bar on the right. Uh, but these cells are essentially completely de depleted in later time points in that same patient, supporting the conclusion that while TCR alpha or beta deletion may improve the persistence of these cells, PD-1 deletion does not appear to. And finally, we wondered uh, what was the cell state of the persistent T cells? And uh, what might be the reason for this depletion of PD-1 edited cells over time? In theory, deletion of PD-1 might not be predicted to improve exhaustion or cell function, knowing what we know now, uh, but we weren't necessarily expecting that this edit would, uh, would cause a loss of fitness. So to answer this, we now looked at the uh, RNA-seq profiles, the gene expression of these cells that were edited, uh, expressing the NYESO transgene and persisting over time in this patient. And what we saw was a dramatic change in the gene expression signature of these cells where cells persisting three or four months later in these patients had adopted uh, a completely different phenotype from the infusion product, uh, that of a central memory T cell expressing IL-7 receptor, CCR7, and TCF7. So taking this all together, I think that it does make some sense. Uh, first, it's nice to see that a population of these infused CAR T cells were adopting a long-lasting uh, memory cell fate. Uh, and second, uh, previous studies from John Wary's group 
had shown that in mice, uh, deletion of PD-1 could actually inhibit the development of T cell memory. And indeed, uh, I think that's exactly what we're seeing here in the context of CAR T cell therapy in humans. So to summarize this last part of the talk, what I showed you was our first attempt at improving T cell therapies using gene editing uh, in the context of this first in human clinical trial. I think that the most important takeaway from the study is that the products appeared to be safe in these three patients and that the edited cells, or at least some of them, could indeed persist uh, long-term and adopt a memory phenotype. I think we've also added further support for the lack of functional benefit of deleting PD-1 from T cells, uh, which is in line with what we showed in the context of checkpoint blockade studies. But I do think this study opens up a lot of opportunities in the future to use insights that we gain from single cell studies in tumors and checkpoint blockade to prospectively engineer cell therapies with improved function. And then further, to really deeply analyze those clinical trials and patient samples, once again, using single cell genome technologies. Again, all of this work was really led by Carl June and his team at Penn, and all of the single cell work that I described uh, was done by uh, another excellent student, Kevin Parker and Yan Yan Chi in the lab. So what I've tried to demonstrate to you today is the many ways that we're using single cell technologies to really deeply understand the cellular and molecular basis for cancer immunity, uh, really all in the context of primary patient samples. I think we all envision that these technologies will only continue to improve in sensitivity, scale, and uh, their ability to integrate many layers of genomic information into a single assay. And I really think these will be tremendously valuable in how we uh, think about design and, and understand cancer immunotherapies in the future. So thank you all for your attention, and uh, I'd also just like to thank all of the really terrific members of my lab for their important contributions to this work and uh, work that I didn't have time to discuss today. I'd also like to thank all of the collaborators at, at Stanford and elsewhere, and of course the 10X Genomics team. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Satpathy, for a great presentation. We are ready to get started with our live Q&A session. Please remember to submit your questions using the Q&A box on your screen. We'll do our best to get through as many questions as possible. All right, let's get started. All right, so first question, how did you annotate the different T cell types? Thanks for that question. So uh, the way that we did it is by uh, comparing uh, the transcriptional signatures of individual uh, cell subsets to known marker genes. We also did an unbiased comparison to uh, databases of, of bulk uh, RNA-seq samples. For single cell attack seq, the way that we annotated clusters was uh, using gene scores, which is a uh, aggregate attack seq signal in each gene locus. This is a method called Cicero, developed by Cole Trapnel and Jason Dury's group. And using the gene scores, we could uh, do the exact same thing, use marker genes and compare to bulk profiles. Great. Next question. Were the naive T cells and naive early activated T cells a mix of CD4 and CD8? Uh, yes, they were. And I think as, as many of you probably know, CD4 and CD8 uh, have some sparsity and recovery in single cell RNA-seq data. Um, so I think that is always a, a bit difficult to perfectly annotate mixed clusters. Uh, and as you all also probably know, there, there are methods now combining protein information uh, with RNA-seq. Um, this is a method called site-seq uh, from Peter Smebert and Rahul Satija. And I think uh, using those methods maybe will overcome some of the challenges of, of um, missing information from RNA-seq data. All right. Referring to the first part, as you said, there was clonal expansion of exhausted T cells post therapy. This was overall observed, overall observed, or did you compare between responders and non-responders? If yes, did you see differences in the transcriptome or TCR repertoire of the exhausted subsets of responders versus non-responders? Yeah, this is a this is a great question. Um, 
So the answer is that you see clonal expansion of exhausted cells in both responders and non-responders. And I think that reflects the fact that um, those are just the cells that are recognizing tumors and clonally expanding and you know, seeing this chronic antigen signal and becoming exhausted. Uh, we actually didn't uh, do the comparison that you uh, suggest, which is to compare the exhaustion signatures of non-responders and, non uh, and responders. Uh, I can say that they didn't seem to cluster separately or on either side of the exhausted cluster, for example, but that's a good suggestion. Thank you. All right, next question. Given the limited sensitivity of single cell ataxy versus bulk ataxy, what are the use cases for single cell ataxy versus first identifying unique transcriptional clusters via single cell RNA seq and sorting them for bulk ataxy? Thanks for that question. I think this is a complicated question. Um, so I, I think the, the um, person asking the question is referring to sensitivity of recovering individual ataxic peaks in single cells, so the sparsity of the data. And, uh, in, uh, and I think it's, you know, even this part is complicated because it depends on the method you use to get single cell ataxic data. So uh, some prior methods, including ones that, that we developed, uh, actually have much more sparsity. So you'll get on the order of 500 to, you know, a few thousand unique ataxic reads per cell. And that's been difficult to uh, analyze in sort of an unbiased way without having some bulk uh, reference maps or bulk RNA-seq signatures, uh, as the person suggests. Uh, in my opinion, the 10x method, uh, and this is really uh, due to the great work of the 10x genomics team, uh, you know, has a pretty good sensitivity in comparison to other methods. So we're getting for immune cells on average 10,000 to 15,000 unique ataxic reads and peaks per cell. And so, uh, you know, combined with some of the computational advances that have come out in the last year, uh, our opinion is that you can get all of the same cell clusters from single cell ataxic data that you can from single cell RNA-seq data. And I think I showed some examples of that in the context of BCC T cells. There's a second part of the question which is um, sensitivity of detecting rare cells in the sample. Um, so, for example, if you have a really rare, you know, population of 1% or half a percent of your T cells, you might not uh, efficiently capture that in an unbiased single cell assay. And so there, I think it is uh, actually really valuable uh, if you can, you know, maybe do a deeper unbiased profiling or use some orthogonal method to identify that population and then enrich for it somehow to uh, uh, before going on to either single cell or bulk attack seek. And I think this is particularly relevant for uh, things like uh, rare progenitor cells in hematopoiesis uh, or even rare uh, T cell progenitors and things like that. Um, I hope that, I, that answered the question. Thanks for that. Great. Um, how would you compare the information you can get from trajectory analysis using single cell attack versus single cell RNA? So uh, I'm not sure if the question is referring to um, compare the, the additional value of the data that you get from either one or how you actually link the cells between both trajectories. I can just answer both questions. So for the first um, interpretation of how do you uh, how do you compare the information that you get from each assay? I think both things give you complementary in information, right? So the TACSEQ um, gives you the uh, trajectory of enhancers and promoters that are changing along a differentiation path, and I think is also particularly useful for identifying transcription factor activity that's changing during that differentiation path. Uh, while RNA-seq, you know, uh, gives you the RNA transcripts, and both of those could be useful in different ways. Uh, we have also uh, built some computational tools, uh, really uh, together with Will Greenleaf's lab, to actually link cells in both trajectories. And the way that we do that is through this gene score that I mentioned earlier. So from the ATAC-seq data, you can get uh, these aggregate gene scores, which now give you uh, a signal in each single cell for each gene instead of just the enhancer or promoter. And then you can directly link the activity of that gene to the activity of the transcript in the single cell RNA-seq data. So in that way, you can 
uh, really uh, link together the two, two trajectories and two data sets and you don't have to analyze them in isolation. Great. Um, is there an overlap of TCR sequences between TDAG and effector T cells in the tumor, or are these distinct populations? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, thanks for that. And, and I didn't have time to uh, discuss it today, but um, it is in the paper. So this is something that we were uh, particularly interested in. And I think the short answer is that uh, among CD4 T cell types, uh, TCR clones or TCR repertoires were relatively restricted to each phenotype. So meaning that Treg TCRs were um, very specifically Treg TCRs and TH17s were very specifically TH17s, et cetera. Um, that sort of um, compartmentalization broke down if you look at the CD8 side, and maybe that makes sense because those cells are, uh, you know, more along a differentiation trajectory of going from naive to activated to exhausted. But you could see some patterns there too uh, among certain phenotypes. Uh, and importantly, I'll add one more thing, which is that uh, that uh, compartmentalization or lack of sharing of TCRs between phenotypes and CD4 cells uh, didn't change after PD1. So if you compare to pre or post therapy sample, uh, meaning that you know PD1 doesn't change the sort of locked in state, which goes in with uh, goes along with what I uh, uh, talked about in the talk today. All right, next question. Have you completed or considered performing single cell ataxies of adaptively transferred CAR T or TCR T cells and observed any key differences in the epigenetic state in long term persistent transferred T cells? Uh, great question. We haven't uh, done it yet. Of course, we're thinking about it. If uh, you want to collaborate, we'd be happy to do that. Great. Um, next question, what methods do you use to batch correct or overlay single cell RNA-seq profiles for the many patients? Can you repeat that question? Sure. So it's, what methods do you use to batch correct or overlay, overlay single cell RNA-seq profiles from many patients? Yeah, this is a great question, too. Um, I, I think I would refer you to a lot of Rahul Satija's work uh, and reviews on this topic. Um, we've largely, you know, we haven't been developers of these uh, integration methods, and we've largely followed the lead of, of, of other um, people who are more heavily involved in the single cell RNA seq side. Uh, we have used things like Harmony uh, in the past, but I think that uh, it's a it's a it's a data specific and um, and also a technology specific thing um, or choice. Uh, so we've tried a couple of them, but uh, again, I'll, I'll refer, for, refer you to Rahul's uh, work. All right, thank you. Um, were you able to study if anti-PD-1 treatment was expanding the number of antigens that were seen by the immune system? Uh, and this is a really interesting question as well. Um, we've, we've tried to get at this. We haven't directly uh, answered the question. And the way that you would directly answer that is by assessing tumor antigen specificity of the pre-existing clones versus the uh, new clones that come in post-therapy. Um, what I can tell you is that we did this glyph analysis, which uh, pairs TCRs according to their predicted specificity. Uh, and glyph groups that were present pre and post therapy uh, did differ, suggesting that, I mean, there was some overlap, but there was some difference too. So that suggests that uh, at least some of the TCRs that are newly recruited to the tumor post therapy were seeing new antigens. Uh, again, this is a computational prediction, so uh, we don't, we haven't validated that idea. But uh, it does make some sense if, if um, many of you think about uh, tumor evolution over time, and especially in the context of therapy, uh, that definitely also happens in immunotherapy, and we showed that in the BCC samples. And so it makes sense that, uh, you know, as you treat a tumor uh, in a patient long term, that that uh, tumor will lose some mutations, perhaps gain some others, and the T cell response will evolve as well. All right, next question. Curious to know how the endogenous PCR mutated and the uh, NYESO1 PCR negative T cells persisted in vivo. 
So the question is, in the CAR-T CRISPR trial, uh, the persistence of TCR edited NYE so negative cells. Is that correct? Yes. That's a good question. Um, I think the limitation of that, of answering that question, is that, uh, again, comes from sparsity of single cell data. So it's difficult to know um, if you, if the cell was truly NYE so negative or uh, if you just failed to detect the transcript in the single cell assay. Um, that being said, the population of uh, PCR alpha beta edited cells that were NYE so negative, at least detected to be negative, uh, did seem to decline over time, which is uh, what you might expect if a T cell is missing any TCR. But I think we really need to go uh, deeper and, and perhaps improve the method a bit to answer that fully. Okay, great. Um, next question, have you compared the single cell attack epigenomic trajectory map with RNA-seq based trajectories such as RNA velocity? That's a great question. Um, we haven't done it ourselves. I know there are other groups working on that. Um, you know, of course, for those of you who don't know, uh, RNA velocity, which was developed by Ben Lynn Arston and, and, and several other colleagues, um, allows you to predict the trajectory of individual cells, even that are closely related, based on uh, mRNA expression patterns. Uh, and so it, it is a good idea to compare the trajectories that we get from single cell attack seek to something that's uh, maybe a bit more grounded in truth, uh, like RNA velocity. Um, but we just haven't done it yet. And I think there's a there's a difficulty of, of um, you know, you can do a, a relatively okay job of pairing the two trajectories in the way that I mentioned before using gene scores, but it's not perfect. So I, I think there needs to be some further work to do that. Okay, great. Um, we only have a few questions left in the queue, so if you have any additional questions, please enter them now. Um, here's another one. This one's a bit forward-looking. What other layers would you need to have to have the complete picture of tumor cells? Are there any additional data layers you would add in to the analysis? Uh, yeah, DNA sequencing. So I think the the major, uh, you know, we try. You can get at some aspects of of um, copy number variation uh, from RNA seq or attack seq data uh, by aggregating signal over context of, of the genome, um, but you can't uh, often get you know what you really want, which is point mutations in each cell. Um, there's been uh, work uh, from Dan Landau's group doing uh, genotyping of tumor mutations combined with RNA transcriptomes in a targeted way, uh, similar in, in strategy to what I showed you in the CAR T cell work. Um, but again, there you can you can do targeted amplification uh, and not really whole genome. So uh, if I had a wish list, I think for understanding the, the tumor side, um, you know, some sort of uh, highly sensitive DNA sequencing method, single cell scale combined with uh, RNA attack, other things would be useful. Okay, great, thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. So in regards to the expanded PD-1 clone post-treatment, are the cells present in pre-treatment infiltrated to tumor and expanded, or do you have any info on whether they are present in peripheral blood post-treatment also? Can you repeat that question? Yes. Um, so in regards to the expanded PD-1 clone post-treatment, are the cells present in pre-treatment infiltrated to the tumor and expanded? Do you have any information on whether they are present in the peripheral blood post-treatment? I'm not sure if I uh, understand the first part of that question, but the second part, um, yes, they are present in the blood post-treatment. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, that's not only our finding, that's been shown by several other groups um, in the context of PD-1, uh, showing that after PD-1 therapy, the, the clonal uh, some of the clones that you can find in the tumor are also find in, uh, found in the blood. And so uh, in our analysis, we saw about uh, 35 or 40 percent, depending on the patient, uh, of the post-treatment clones found in the blood at the same time. All right, thank you.
So it looks like we're at the top of the hour. So that about wraps it up for today's session of the 10X Genomics Virtual Cancer Symposium. Thank you so much to our guest speaker, Dr. Amsu Satpathy, for joining us for the live Q&A, and to all of our attendees for some great questions. As a reminder, a recording of this session will be available shortly. And if, you didn't get, if we didn't get to your question, or if you have a follow-up question, please email our support team at support at 10xgenomics.com. And finally, we invite you to join us tomorrow for our talk with uh, Dr. Carl Gay and Dr. Allison Stewart from MD Anderson, titled Increased Intratumoral Heterogeneity After the Onset of Therapy Resistance in Small Cell Lung Cancer, as well as our talks throughout the week. To learn more and register for the talk, please visit the 10X Genomics events page. Thank you so much again to Dr. Satpathy, and thank you all, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.